Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 347, Novations on the Trinity, Part 1, Almost Pope. In these episodes, I'm going to discuss a very interesting early work on, quote, the Trinity, written by a Roman church leader named Novation. In this first part, I'm going to talk about his character and life and the major challenge that he faced. And my main source for his life is a good recent book entitled Novation of Rome and the Culmination of Pre-Nicene Orthodoxy by Dr. James L. Papandrea. And I'll put a link to this book on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Novation, we think, was born probably around the year 200 AD and was probably himself a Roman. And there seem to be some obvious influences of the Stoic philosophical school in his thinking, In fact, one ancient source says that he was a Stoic philosopher before he became a Christian, but it's not clear whether or not this is true. As Papandrea observes, the Stoic flavor of his thinking may just be the result of his Roman education. He does, though, as we'll eventually hear, have a liking for carefully laid out arguments. Whether or not he was an actual Stoic philosopher, he very well could have been a teacher of rhetoric or philosophy. And Papandrea points out that if he was upwardly mobile, if he was intent on having a visible public career, he may well have put off being baptized until his retirement. At least that would have been his initial plan. Now, why did people commonly put off baptism in this era? In the New Testament, you see that when someone believes, they rush off and get baptized right away. So what changed? I'm not sure I entirely understand the mindset, but I think the main elements are these. First of all, they thought of baptism as a washing away of sins. Which sins? The sins that you've already committed up to that point. Okay, but what about then major after-baptism sins? Oops, you can only get baptized once, and then maybe you're just now going to be damned because of these post-baptism sins. So the solution is, wait until you're just about ready to die, and until your passions have cooled down and you're done with most of your sinning, and then get yourself baptized. And then maybe at that point you'll be ready to leave the sins behind. So you have some ambitious career, maybe you're going to have to lie, cheat, steal, become arrogant, commit adultery, who knows? And so ambitious people in this period would sometimes put off their baptism until much later. And this strategy would explain why Novation was given a kind of emergency baptism at one point. In his 30s, he fell seriously ill with we don't know what and thought that he might die. And so he received what was then called a clinical baptism. Presumably they assumed that he was on his deathbed, or at least there was a good chance of that. So boom, emergency baptism. Later in mainstream Christianity, A rule was made that a person baptized in that way was not qualified to be a priest or a bishop. In fact, that might have been a norm in Novation's time as well, but apparently an exception was made for him. So having been baptized in his 30s, he gave up whatever his secular career was and ended up being ordained as a priest by the Bishop of Rome, who was named Fabian. Fabian was Bishop of Rome from 236 until 250. So, Novation being ordained as a priest must have happened in 236 or later. Again, it seems that an exception must have been made for him to this general norm that you couldn't hold church office if you had had a clinical baptism. Why did they make an exception for him? Well, probably because he was very learned and eloquent, and, you know, people looked up to him, and so they thought this guy would be a good leader. And it was sometime not long after this that Novation wrote the book that I'll be focusing on in these episodes. But before we get to that book, we're going to have to talk about the biggest challenge of his life, a series of events that started in the year 249 with the Edict of Decius. The historian Dr. J.B. Rivers summarizes the decree of Decius and its historical effects in these words. 
In AD 249, the emperor Trajan Decius issued an edict requiring the inhabitants of the Roman Empire to sacrifice to the gods. With this decree, he also inaugurated the first empire-wide persecution of Christians. Previously, persecution of Christians had always been local affairs determined by local conditions. Thereafter, persecutions were largely instigated by emperors and took place on an imperial scale. It has consequently become common to distinguish pre decian persecution, characterized by its local and ad hoc nature, from the centrally organized persecutions of Decius in AD 249 and 50, Emperor Valerian in AD 257 through 260, and Diocletian, Galerius, and Maximus in AD 303 to 313. The importance of the decree as a turning point in the history of Christian persecution is thus widely recognized. Beyond this, discussions of the decree have usually focused on its precise nature and the motivations behind it. Given the limited evidence, however, these discussions have tended to be inconclusive. Worship the Roman gods or die. Some Christians chose the second option. One of the first to die was the famous leader of the Christians in the capital city of the empire, Bishop Fabian of Rome. It didn't seem like a good idea to the Roman Christians to immediately pick another bishop of Rome, because this would be the next person the Roman persecutors would head to the door of. So the Christians there waited for over a year before they picked another bishop. But in the meantime, they did, I assume quietly, pick a sort of interim leader to carry out some of the bishop functions, and that was Novation. Dr. Papandrea writes, Novation was chosen to lead the church as acting bishop and chair of the council of priests during this time. It is all but certain that Novation was selected for this position because of his theological treatise on the Trinity. And then he mentions how one of Novation's contemporaries referred to him sarcastically as, quote, this master of doctrine. And Papandrea comments that this acknowledges that Novation's ability as a theologian won for him the honor of being the spokesman for the Roman Church. Thus, we have to assume that the theology reflected in On the Trinity was considered orthodox in Rome at the time. I would agree with that, but just add a qualification. What it shows us is what some mainstream Christians considered orthodox during that time. It also shows two rival theologies that some mainstream Christians were into, as we'll hear at length. Papandrea says, Novation's On the Trinity is his magnum opus. It was clearly written before the persecution broke out, probably during the time that Novation was a priest under Fabian, therefore in the late 30s or 40s of the 3rd century. Its original title was probably The Rule of Truth, since this is how it begins, and since the Latin word Trinitas is not used. The document is, in essence, a commentary on the old Roman creed, the, quote, rule of faith. The writing style shows Novation's education, but it also shows his desire to write for the common person. The Latin is not a high, polished Latin, but a more popular style, which tells us that the document was meant to help the average Christian understand the faith, and it was probably used as a catechetical textbook. But before we get to that book, let's go back to this real-life drama. What would you do if the law said that you can either sacrifice to the gods, or we will execute you? Now you might say, this is just too much, I'm not going to get up every day and worship pagan deities, or I'm not going to go to services once a week and worship pagan deities. Well, they weren't asking that much. As I understand, you didn't have to do it constantly, but you only had to do it once, and you would be given a certificate called a libellus in order to prove that you had done the legally required sacrifice. Now is it really worth dying when you can avoid it just by getting this lousy little piece of paper? This is what some Christians thought. In fact, they saw a kind of loophole here. All I had to do is get my pagan friend to go and sacrifice to the gods and tell the person issuing the certificates that his name was Dale Tuggy, and then I would have the needed certificate, and I wouldn't have to die. Did I lie? Yes. But did I worship the pagan gods? No, I didn't. My pagan friend did. Aren't my hands clean? 
Mm, you can see how this would lead to considerable controversy. Would my hands be clean in a circumstance like that? So what happened in the face of this astounding challenge is that different Christians chose differently. Some Christians simply took a stand and were executed. Other Christians fled. Other Christians made a sacrifice and got the certificate complying with the law. After all, these alleged deities aren't real, right? What real harm can this do? And yet others pulled off the scheme I just described, fraudulently get a certificate through someone else making the sacrifices for you. Now call the last two groups, the sacrificers and the certificate fakers, call them the lapsed. Christian churches after the persecution was over, and even during the persecution, had to decide what to do with these people. For his part, Novation was on the hard-nosed side would have been called the rigorists or purists or puritans. In their view, readmitting people who had committed such serious sins would defile God's holy church. Had they not, in effect, denied Christ? It's up to God if he will ever forgive them, but in the rigorist view, the church should not readmit such sinners. On the other side, how could it be that Christ's atoning death should not cover even such sins? Cannot even a murderer be forgiven? And where in Scripture is this supposed limit on the church's power of offering forgiveness through Christ? So those were the two extreme views. Like, hey, this is just another sin. They repented. They can just get right back in and be members in good standing. The other side was, no, you just denied Christ in front of everybody, and you worshipped idols and denied the one true God. So we're not taking you back in to defile this congregation of saints. So, Novation ended up being the leader of the rigorist or the purist side in this argument. And after more than a year had passed and the Roman church decided to pick a new bishop, they didn't pick him. He very well may have thought that he deserved to be the next Roman bishop, the next pope, if you like, although that's a little bit anachronistic. But for whatever reason, he missed out. But he didn't take this line down. He ended up being the bishop over a rival stream of pure churches. These churches separated from those who did not take a rigorous position about the lapsed. And interestingly, this rival stream of pure but otherwise mainstream churches lasted into the 300s AD. In fact, they're mentioned at the famous council at Nicaea in the year 325. Now, because he was voted bishop by the pure faction, Novation is sometimes called an anti pope. Certainly, he was a rival Roman bishop until, tradition says, he was killed by Roman persecution in the year 258. So, later generations tended to view Novation as a schismatic, somebody who unjustifiably, sinfully separated from God's true church, something almost as bad as being a heretic. So, as time went on, his reputation decreased. In fact, his works survived only because they were falsely attributed to Tertullian or Cyprian or Origen. So, the various books of his that we have now survived by being included in collections of their writings, being mistaken for their writings. But in the modern era, starting in around 1579, scholars started to piece together that these books were really by innovation, and so now there is widespread agreement that we have four surviving works of his, entitled The Trinity or On the Trinity, The Spectacles, which is about Roman entertainment, Jewish foods, and In Praise of Purity. We also have three of his letters. When the Trinity's podcast returns, why doesn't Novation use the word Trinity in this book?
But going back to his book on the Trinity, this tells us a good deal about the orthodoxy as of around the year 230. The overall picture is very similar to that of Origen, although as Dr. Papandrea notes, arguably Origen and Novation did not know about one another's writings. Traditionally, this book has come to be called On the Trinity, or just The Trinity, but as you heard Dr. Papandrea say, that probably was not his original title. Why? Because he doesn't use the word Trinitas anywhere in the book. Now this is most curious, because the Greek word trias and the Latin word trinitas had come into some use by the last two decades of the 100s, and these terms would have been fairly well known in the early 200s. Also, it's clear that the author read and admired Tertullian, and Tertullian uses the Latin word trinitas. So it looks like Novation has purposely avoided the word. Why would he do that? I can think of a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not mentioned in the traditional Roman rule of faith that he uses as his framework for this book. So it may have struck him that this word Trinitas was newfangled and just unnecessary. I mean, if it was necessary, it'd be in the creed, right? And once we fully understand his theology, we can see that it is unnecessary for him because he doesn't believe in a triune God or a tripersonal God nor does he believe in a triad of three equally divine beings. And this is a crucial point. Even today, the term the Trinity is used either as a singular referring term or as a plural referring term. Used as a singular referring term, it's referring to the Father, Son, and Spirit as one thing, as one God. It's a label for the triune God when used as a singular referring term. Only a Trinitarian will use the word Trinity as a singular referring term. Unitarian Christians like me don't believe there is any such thing as the triune God, and so we're not going to use a word to refer to this fictional entity. But this usage of Trinity only dates from the second half of the 300s. Before then, when the words trios in Greek and Trinitas in Latin were coined somewhere maybe around the year 180, from then until the middle of the 300s, authors did occasionally use the words trios and trinitas, but they always used them as plural referring terms. These are kind of quasi names that refer not to a thing, but to several things. So used in this way, trinity, trios in Greek, trinitas in Latin, refers to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now that might sound Trinitarian to you, but it need not be Trinitarian. You could be a Unitarian and just think that you're referring to this group. There's God, that's the Father. There's the Son of God, that's the human Jesus. And then there's the Spirit of God, which is God's Spirit, not an additional divine person. And you can just call that the Trinity. That's in fact how all these early authors are using the word although the second member of the trio for many of them would have been the Logos of John 1 and not the man Jesus. It does group them together, and so you might worry that it makes the three of them a little bit too equal, that it kind of suggests or hints at that they are the same kind of thing or that they are equal in status or something like that. Someone like Novation might well have used the term Trinity, but he doesn't. Why? because it's newfangled and unnecessary. Maybe, you know, you're just imitating the triads of Platonic philosophies. Why do we need to get into that? If it was understood as a singular referring term, it would suggest modalism, the Trinity as the name of the one God who exists in three ways or lives in three ways. Or it could suggest tritheism, a group of three ontological peers, a triad of three equally divine beings. And he doesn't want that either. So there's really no reason why he needs to use the word Trinity. It could be used by theologies that he disagrees with. And it's not a term required by what was considered the essential Christian teaching in his time. So why get into it? As you heard Dr. Papandreas say, the original title of the book might have been The Rule of Truth. The Rule of Truth was a basic minimal creed that was used in baptism in the 2nd and 3rd centuries and is roughly similar to the later so-called Apostles' Creed. And for more on the Apostles' Creed, you can check out Trinity's podcast number 12. Spoiler alert, no, it wasn't really by the Apostles. However, it does have things that most Christians, even most Unitarian Christians, can agree to, for the most part. 
when the Trinity's podcast returns. A quick overview of Novation's book and what it tells us about the theological landscape within the mainstream Christianity of his time. I want to give you now just a kind of overview of the whole book. And then in a further installment, we're going to really dig in to the crucial last two chapters of the book. The traditional creeds start, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. And so Novation starts off by explicating his belief in God. Who's that? Is it the Trinity? No, it's the Father. And that's why Novation is a Unitarian Christian and not a Trinitarian one. So he carries on for the first eight chapters, just explicating God and his divine attributes. You know, he's eternal, uncreated, perfect in power, knowledge, goodness, and so on. Starting with chapter 9, he starts to teach about the Son. Chapters 9 through 31, he is very concerned to push back on several heresies, several rival views about Jesus. One of those views is what scholars call docetism, which is a view on which Jesus appears to be a human being, but isn't really one. Maybe he's really a spirit, or an eon, or a phantom, or something, but he's not really a man, he only appears that way. This was taught by various kinds of groups that later scholars refer to as Gnostics, and it's just Obviously, something that won't fly, given the New Testament, which repeatedly refers to Jesus as a man. And you can just observe him being born, talking, walking, eating, sleeping. Yeah, that's not a ghost. That's not a spirit. That's not an apparition. He's a man. Other big concerns of his also have to do with rival Christologies. This might make you ask, what about the Holy Spirit? I thought this book was about all three of them. This label on the Trinity has been slapped on it. Isn't there a discussion of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Chapter 29, the third to last chapter, is on the Holy Spirit. And it's really rather tacked on. That is just not something that he's interested in. And it wasn't the subject of controversy at this time. Chapter 29 is just an afterthought, devoid of any deep thinking. Just corresponds to the element in the creed, yeah, oh, I also believe in the Holy Spirit. I think if push came to shove, he would probably have assumptions about the Holy Spirit like those of Origen and Tertullian. On these views, the Holy Spirit is the third greatest being. It's a divine spirit, but it's less divine than the Logos, which is less divine than God. So the three greatest beings would be God, the Logos, and the Spirit in that order. But he doesn't say that here. He just reproduces a bunch of scriptural language and then moves on to what he's really concerned about. Okay, so the Christological targets of his in the bulk of this book are what later scholars call modalistic monarchianism and dynamic monarchianism. Modalistic monarchians, also called in ancient times Sibelians, after the obscure figure Sibelius, basically reason like this. You have to say that Christ is divine? Right, right, of course you do. You can't say he's a mere man, that's crazy. So, to be divine, in the relevant sense, is to be a god. But there's only one god. So if the Father is a god, because he's divine, and the Son is a god, because he's divine, and there's only one god, then the Father and the Son must be the same god. So you could call them father-son or son-father. You can say the father died on the cross for you or the son died on the cross for you. What's the difference? It's just two names for the same one. Right. This is broadly similar to the theology of modern-day oneness Pentecostalism. And I think it's a confusion of the two main characters in the New Testament, God and Jesus, which has always been common to the ordinary reader who's not paying very much attention and doesn't think very deeply about it. 
So you can find some apocryphal early Christian writings which do seem to just collapse Jesus and God. So Jesus just is God. He's like an avatar or something. It's just a manifestation of the one true God. It's God in human form. Of course, then it's hard to see why you don't have docetism out of that. Because if any God is not a man, then Jesus is a God, then he's not a man. Okay, but maybe you can combine that with what scholars call a logos anthropos view of Christ, where when it's time for the incarnation, the eternal word, the divine logos, assumes or mysteriously unites with not just a human nature, but a man. A human nature in the sense of an individual person like me or you. Okay, but look, you can't say the Father died on the cross. You can't say the Father and Son are the same God. That just implies that they're just one in the same period. If they were numerically the same thing, then whatever is true of one would be true of the other, which is crazy. Right? God sent his only Son into the world to save us. Jesus did not send his only Son into the world. Jesus doesn't have a Son in the sense that God has a Son. God said to him on an occasion, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Jesus never said that to anybody. That was said about him, but he didn't say it. Okay, there's a difference between Jesus and God. So all you have to do to refute modalistic monarchianism is to point out that we just can't collapse God and Jesus. In other words, say that they're numerically one and the same one, because scripture teaches different things about them. It assumes and implies that there are differences between them. Or think about Jesus praying in the garden, Father, if it's your will, may this cup pass from me. At that point, Jesus didn't want to be crucified, but God did want Jesus to be crucified. Okay, well, one and the same one can't want and not want the same thing at the same time in the same way. So, yeah, it looks like there's a simultaneous difference there. So you know they are two. They're not one and the same. And mainstream Christianity was quite correct to pass this by, at least in its official creeds. This still survives on the popular level today. It's all over the place in the apologetics world, for instance. It's still today, people who don't think as deeply, is, hey, look, Jesus is called God, so clearly Jesus is God. If Jesus is God, then God is Jesus, right? Two words for the same thing. It's like Samuel Clemens and Mark Twain. It's a terrible misreading of the New Testament, but it's a view that we still battle with today. And that is because the standard creeds are not sufficient to clearly rule out such views. Traditional theological statements can be and often are read as consistent with the numerical sameness of the Father and the Son, but that's another conversation. So Novation considers this at various points throughout the book, but we're going to come back to this in the next episode with two specific arguments that he attributes to the modalistic monarchians and we're going to see what his responses to those arguments are. The other, quote, heresy that he's dying to refute in the body of this book, in the bulk of the middle part, is what later scholars have called dynamic monarchians. On this view, there is something divine in Jesus, but it's just God's dunamis, his power. That's where the later label comes from. So, for instance, the word of John 1, which becomes flesh and dwells among us, They didn't think that was the pre-human Jesus. They thought that was something like God's wisdom and power, which, metaphorically speaking, became a man, which is just to say that God gave his spirit without measure to Jesus, and God you know, revealed himself fully through Jesus, and that Jesus had an unrivaled measure of God's wisdom in him. The dynamic monarchians, some of them, we know, claim that their view was the original Christology, and that the other ones innovated and branched off from them. They opposed the Gnostics, many of whom had a docetic Jesus, a not-really-human Jesus. They opposed the modalistic monarchians. You can't collapse together God and Jesus. God and Jesus are two. God, that is to say the Father, is the one true God. Jesus is explicitly, in the New Testament, a man. So yeah, those are two different beings. They also opposed what was an innovation in the middle of the 100s, which was this increasingly popular Logos speculation. So the word mentioned in John 1, they thought, hey, this word which was with God and was God, that's like an additional divine person of some sort. And it's already there when God creates. It already exists in the beginning. Now, maybe God brought it into existence five minutes before, but anyway, when it was time to create, Logos already existed. 
And this fit together with some elements of Greek philosophy and Platonic theology. Specifically, some Platonists thought that the ultimate source of everything was just too transcendent to have any direct contact with this crummy material world. But hey, all he has to do is first emanate out this in-between, this being who's neither created nor uncreated, and then God can create the world through this one. And the Lagos theorist said, yeah, that's what John's talking about in John 1. So clearly God can't create directly, right? Right. So he has to create through his word, which originally was his own wisdom, but now he's brought it into being as a second powerful divine being next to him. And then he has that one create directly and God's kind of sponsoring it all. God's still the ultimate source, but the direct maker of the world is actually this somewhat lesser divine being, this word. The dynamic monarchians we know said, wait a second, first of all, you're telling us there are two gods, two divine beings, but there's only one God, and that's clearly the Father. Second of all, you're telling us that there are two creators, that there's this direct creator that had to do this on God's behalf, and then God's the indirect creator, the one who's behind it all. But no, Scripture just gives all the credit to Yahweh alone. Yahweh, who is credited solely with creation in the Old Testament, is the same one who's called the Father in the New Testament. That's just reading comprehension. Of course, the standard dismissal of a dynamic monarchian view about God and Jesus is that surely, surely Jesus couldn't be a mere man, meaning a human person like me or you without this extra component acting in them, this, in some sense, divine person. Well, surely that is question-begging and really not much of an argument. The real question is, which kind of view makes best sense of the New Testament overall? You probably know what I think about it. If you don't, you can check out podcast 334, Who Do You Say I Am? The common concern of both of these rival views to this newfangled Logos theology, where there's a second God and a second creator, the dynamic and modalistic monarchians have in common that they are monarchians, which is to say that they are concerned with the monarchy, with the rule of the one God. There's really only one God. That's a foundational point for both of these groups as against the Logos theorists. They just go different directions. Modalistic monarchians say there's only one God. Jesus clearly is God, right? Right. So Jesus and the Father are the same God. So you can talk about a son father or a father son and just use those words interchangeably, basically. The dynamic monarchians say there's only one God. This is clearly the Father. And Jesus clearly isn't the Father. So maybe you could say he's divine in that he has divine power in him, but. The way you preserve monotheism is not by smooshing Jesus into God, but just by recognizing that the one God is the Father alone. You don't need a second God or a second creator. Nor do you need to have a divine element in Christ when God is working through him. God has given him his power, his spirit, and his wisdom. That's enough. You don't need an extra metaphysical component. He just needs whatever a human has, and then this calling and gift of God. So he goes on about these three enemies, docetism, dynamic monarchianism, and modalistic monarchianism, or Sabellianism, though he doesn't call them those names, in chapters 9 through 28, and he goes through different proof texts that he thinks to refute different positions. Then he has a little kind of perfunctory chapter on the Holy Spirit, just so he covers that base in the creed. But what's most revealing about this book are the last two chapters, chapters 30 and 31 where he realizes that he hasn't really fully dealt with the modalistic monarchians and the dynamic monarchians because he really hasn't dealt with their core concern of monotheism. As a Logos theorist, he's saying there is this divine Logos, this second divine person that's already there at creation. It's with God and it, quote, is God. Well, why exactly is that not two gods? Good question. So in chapter 30, he's going to consider three arguments, two from the modalistic monarchians and one from the dynamic monarchians, and he's going to respond as best he can, and then he's going to throw in one more agonized final chapter where he again tries to wrap all of this up in a satisfying way, and it'll be up to you to judge whether he does that. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Novation says over and over that Jesus is God. But what does he mean by that? 
When a person says that Jesus is God, there are primarily three things that they might mean. They might be identifying, they might be classifying, or they might be labeling. Let me explain. To say that Jesus is God in the sense of identifying is to say that Jesus and God are one and the same. God is Jesus and Jesus is God. We're just talking about two names for the same thing, basically. It's like the statement that Samuel Clemens is Mark Twain. On the other hand, a person who says that Jesus is God might be classifying Jesus or describing what sort of being Jesus is. Now, in ancient times, due to the influence of Greek philosophy, this was oftentimes put in terms of nature. A nature is either a thing of a certain type, or a nature is that which things of a certain type have that makes them things of that type. So they might call you a human nature and me a human nature, or they might say that there's this thing called humanity, which is our nature, and that's supposed to be the properties in virtue of which you're human and in virtue of which I'm human. It's because we have human nature. They also tended to assume that natures could be had in degrees, or a thing could be a nature of a certain kind to a degree. So if you say that Jesus is God and you're classifying, what you're saying is that he is a god, or equivalently, that he is a divine nature, to some extent divine, or you're saying that he has divine nature, or that he to some extent has divine nature. Third, when you say that Jesus is God, you might just be saying that he is, quote, God that the term or name or title God applies to him. If I say, I'm a Dale, that's to say that I am one of the beings who is rightly referred to as Dale. If you're saying that Jesus is God in the labeling sense, you're saying that he can be called or referred to as, quote, God, or a God, perhaps. Now, there are a couple other senses in which a person might say that Jesus is God, some Trinitarians think that that means that Jesus is a proper part of God, or at least at any rate that he's a person within God. These are not relevant to interpreting novation. He doesn't have a concept of a triune God anywhere. He doesn't have a concept anywhere of a person in God. And he would deny, based on the traditional divine attribute of divine simplicity, that there are any proper parts of God. And I think for the same reason he would also deny that there are multiple persons in God, but that depends on how well he understands this extreme and somewhat puzzling ancient doctrine of divine simplicity. But again, I'm going to set those aside. If you're talking to a modern-day Trinitarian, you might have to wonder if they might mean something else by saying that Jesus is God. But Novation, it seems to me, has awareness of these differences. He's aware that if you say that Yahweh is God, you're identifying Yahweh and the one God. He's aware, I think, that if you say that Jesus is God, this is at least saying that the term God can apply to him, and he trots out you know, the favorite traditional proof texts, such as John 1.1, 1, 1, or in chapter 20, where Thomas says, my Lord and my God, he's like, see, Jesus is God. Okay, well, he's at least called God if he interprets those passages rightly. I don't think he does, but set that aside. And he clearly recognizes the difference between being called God or a God and being a God. Now, if you identify Jesus with God, because you're saying Jesus and God are one and the same thing, whatever's true of one will have to be true of the other. So, then however you classify God, you would also have to classify Jesus. Whatever God is rightly called, you would have to also rightly call Jesus. So, in a sense, identifying implies classifying and labeling. If Jesus is God in the identifying sense, then he will have to be of the same kind as God, and he will have to have all the same labels as God. But Novation himself points out that the labeling type of statement, in other words, being called a God or a God, doesn't imply classifying, doesn't imply being a God, or being divine, or having divine nature, or identifying. Now, let me say something about this difference between being God and being a God. Latin cannot make that distinction. In fact, ancient Latin also lacks quotation marks. And as far as I understand, the original text would have been written in all caps. So if you want to say that Jesus is a God with a small g, or if you want to say in English, Jesus is God, capital G, or if you want to say Jesus is, quote, God, with or without the capital, you would just say that Jesus is Deus in Latin.
So the Latin is shot through with ambiguity. They don't have quotation marks, so they can't distinguish labeling from identifying and classifying. They don't have, I think, in the original, capitals, and so the author cannot, by the use of a capital D for Deus, distinguish between calling something a god and calling something god, like the god. And, interestingly, in contrast to English and ancient Greek, there is no word the in Latin. As ancient Christian philosophers like Origen pointed out, in Greek, you can distinguish between theos and ha theos, that is, God and the God. Often in the New Testament, when they're referring to God, they will put the the in front of it. Again, they didn't have capitals in the original text, so this is how they would specify that they meant the one true God himself, not someone else. And others could just be referred to as theos. There is that distinction in ancient Greek, although an author such as John in the fourth gospel will very often use theos without the definite article, without the the, to refer to God. So, it's not exactly a hard and fast rule for Greek. But anyway, ancient Latin doesn't have the word the. So, to say that someone is a god, or that someone is God, like God himself, to identify a person with God, to say that someone is a quote god, you could say all those things by just saying that that person is Deus. And this leads to a lot of ambiguities, a lot of problems in interpretation, and some translation mischief, I think. Here's an interesting example of some translation shenanigans, and this is from the 1974 translation by Russell J. D. Simone, and this is in chapter 20. Novation writes, For if an angel who is subject to Christ is declared to be a god, small g, much more and more fittingly will Christ, to whom all angels are subject, be said to be God, capital G. Now, the decision to put a lowercase g on the first instance of God and to put an uppercase g on the second instance of God, that is the translator's decision. Unfortunately, it doesn't make sense of the argument. It's an all-the-more-so argument. They're saying if something is appropriate to an angel, then much more fittingly will that same thing be appropriate to Christ, because Christ is much greater than any angel. So for the argument to work, we have to understand Deus in the same sense both times, or the sense in which it applies to angels must imply that in another sense it applies to Christ. Now, in what sense is he saying that an angel will be a god? Obviously, he doesn't think an angel just is God himself, so it's not identifying. Obviously, also, he doesn't think that an angel has the divine nature. An angel doesn't have what it is to be a god. Only God will have that. So, clearly, labeling is what's at issue. Now, if an angel is correctly labeled as a god, will it be all the more fitting that Christ has a divine nature or is God himself? No, that would be a terrible non sequitur. So the way to make this argument work requires that being said to be God is understood in the same sense both times. So let me fix that for you, Mr. Translator. It should go like this. For if an angel who is subject to Christ is declared to be a, quote, God, lowercase, much more and more fittingly will Christ, to whom all angels are subject, be said to be a, quote, God. Did you catch that? Said to be a god. That it mentions saying helps us to understand that it's labeling which is at issue. And it really doesn't matter whether we put a lower or uppercase on the word god here, so long as we use quotation marks correctly. The argument is, if you can refer to an angel as a, quote, god, then surely it will be even more appropriate to refer to Christ as a, quote, god. It's a point about words. So again, when we get around to fully hearing Novation's own views, and we find him saying over and over that Jesus is God, we'll need to ask ourselves, when he says that, is he identifying, is he classifying, or is he just labeling? These are distinctions that are going to matter a lot when we actually dig into his views next week on the Trinity's Podcast. This week's thinking music has been the track Retrospective by Koi Discovery. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. 
for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.